What is up guys, DS3 TV here, and we are here for another video. This one is uh, Epic History TV, and it's one of their, I think it's their newest video, Five Great Viking Deaths and what they tell us about the Viking mindset. So let's look at this video. I've seen, I've seen it, and I was like, yeah, we need to probably watch this. So oh yeah, also subscribe to the channel. I want to get a thousand subscribers by Valentine's Day, but I have a smaller goal of 500 subscribers by uh, January 14th, so let's do it. Get five, let's get 500 subscribers by January 14th, and uh, yeah, let's get into the video. Also, you can put videos that you want me to react to in the comment section down below, and I will react to them. And yeah, let's get into it and play. The Vikings and their descendants speak for themselves. Their many voices express a spirit which is like no, which is like no other on earth. AD 793. Raiders appear without warning off England's east coast. They land at Lindisfarne, known as Holy Island, where they slaughter monks, steal treasure and holy relics, then vanish back across the dark sea. It was Western Europe's first traumatic encounter with the Vikings. For three centuries, these pagan pirates from Scandinavia terrorized Europe, raiding, extorting, enslaving, and ultimately conquering. They roamed deep into Russia and the Mediterranean, even daring to attack what they called Miklagard, the great city Constantinople. Viking longships and a mastery of seamanship and navigation gave them the ability to strike at will with the element of surprise. But their enemies, including Anglo-Saxons and Franks, themselves belonged to proud warrior cultures. Was there something more that gave the Vikings their lethal edge? Professor Tom Shippey is an expert in Viking history and medieval literature. He believes their success can be attributed in part to a unique mindset. A mindset revealed in the Vikings' own sagas. We have a great many sagas written in the Vikings' own language, which is Old Norse. There's the famous sagas of Icelanders, but there's also Konungasuga, that's sagas of kings. There's Fornaldasuga, sagas of old times. These are looked on with suspicion these days because they were written hundreds of years later, mostly in far off Iceland. And people say, oh, well, um, you can't rely on those for history. They're fiction. Well, actually, uh, a lot of it is fiction and some of, it's, some of it's fairy tale. And you can pick that out quite easily. But a lot of it isn't fiction. I think it's based on family memories. And people who can't read and write often have good memories and they take memories seriously and they pass them on. Leaving the fact and fiction question aside, they do all express, I think, a very characteristic and consistent attitude, which I call the Viking mindset. And that's really quite distinctive. Two of the distinctive things about it are the fascination with scenes of death, with uh, famous death songs, with famous last stands, all that kind of thing. And the other is the uh, very characteristic sense of humor, which uh, I call, I'm afraid, it's not good sense of humor, it's bad sense of humor. It's the kind of humor which is really rather cruel or grim. Um, and we see quite a lot of Which is, in other words, a dark sense of humor. <laughs> we'll look at five famous death scenes from the old Norse sagas to see what they can tell us about the Viking mindset. This video is sponsored by Curiosity Stream, home to thousands of online documentaries about science, technology, the natural world, and history. Their history section has The death of Ragnar Lud Ludbrock. Number England in 1864. I mean, many tales are told of the legendary Ragnar Lofbrok. His own saga says he was the son of a Swedish king and slew a dragon, but that when he sailed to England seeking further fame and riches, he was shipwrecked off the coast of Northumbria. He was taken prisoner by its Christian king, Ella. 
who decided to inflict a terrible death on the famous Viking. He had him thrown into a pit of venomous snakes. As he faced death, Ragnar called out to the king. The famous line from the death of Ragnar is, Gnithia mundu grisir f galtar hag visi. The piggies would grunt if they knew how the old boar died. The word Gnithia, it means grunt, but it also kind of sounds like grunt. Yeah. And I think you could actually translate it, go oink oink. The piggies would go oink oink if they knew how the old boar died. It's a joke. And the joke is actually on King Ella, because there's this barnyard vocabulary, piggies and oink, but what it means is, my sons are gonna come, and what they do to you won't bear thinking about. It's a threat. The funny thing is, although it's a late saga, this story about the piggies was known earlier, because it was actually quoted by a Latin chronicler. Mm. He'd heard about the piggies, he, he got the phrase right, he just didn't understand what it meant. He thought Ragnar was saying, if my sons knew about this, they'd come and rescue me. But he didn't. He wasn't hoping to rescue, he knew he hadn't got any hope. He was saying, my sons, when they hear about this, then they'll avenge me. And of course they did. Ragnar's death in a snake pit is almost certainly invented. But his sons, the piggies, were very real. In 865, the Ragnarsons landed in England with a great army, rampaging across East Anglia and Northumbria and killing King Ella. Ah. Is there any link between these historical events and the saga tale of Ragnar's death? England was invaded by men who were very early on identified as the Ragnarsons. And my suggestion would be that the whole story of Ragnar's death in the snake pit was made up later on in order to motivate the invasion of England. Why did the Ragnar sons invade England? They did it to take vengeance for their father. And so you make up a story about the death of the father and the way that the vengeance was motivated. King Orlov, uh, Orlov avenged Legier Denmark in uh, the early 6th century AD. According to legend, Rolf Kraki was a great Danish king of the 6th century, a Danish King Arthur. His great hall stood near Lera, where he entertained a famous band of champions. But many sought his throne. His own cousin, Hjurvartha, made a surprise dawn attack on the king's hall. After a desperate last stand, Rolf lay dead, surrounded by his champions. Only one man survived, Vuger, the weakest man in Hrolf's court. He'd been the butt of all jokes, even when he'd sworn to avenge Hrolf's death. Now he was hauled before the new king, Hjurvartha. Rolf is dead, and all his champions are dead as well. That, that's the right thing to do, except Vug, who is dragged out of a pile of bodies. And for some reason, Hjurvartha thinks it would be a good idea to get a Pledge of Allegiance from Rolf's last surviving champion. So they get Vugger, and he is hauled up, asked to swear allegiance to Hjurvartha, and Hjurvartha gives him his sword to swear allegiance on. Bad idea. Vugger picks it up, runs Hjurvartha through. That's the end of Hjurvartha and the Skilding dynasty. And of course, Vugger is immediately killed. But he has fulfilled his vow. So it's another example, really, of uh, the Viking love of, shall we say, wit, of being able to turn the tables in a funny kind of way. Once again, Ragnar's joke was on King Ella, and Vug's joke is on King Hjurvatar. Um, Very funny, um, in a sort of way. Legends about King Hrolf come from a tumultuous period of Europe's history traditionally known as the Dark Ages. But recent discoveries suggest the tales of King Hrolf have a basis in fact. King Hrolf is the Danish King Arthur. They lived at about the same time in the early 6th century. For a long time, 
uh, the story of King Rolf was regarded rather like the story of King Arthur, you know, not, uh, it couldn't be true. But then the archaeologists, alerted by a chance discovery, started looking at the traditional site of King Rolf's court, which is now the small village of Leira in Denmark. And much to their surprise, they discovered the site of one enormous hall after another. I think they have now found six of them, all through the Viking and pre-Viking era. So that part of the story at least was true. Uh, Leira, once upon a time, Hleithraborg, really was a major power centre in the early Viking period. The Yom's how Yom's Viking, how Yom Vikings uh, die. Uh, home of Jager, uh Norway, in 1986 AD. Vikings I mean, were a legendary group of in 986 AD. Viking mercenaries, picked men bound by a code of honor. According to old Norse sagas, they had a fortified base on the Baltic coast at Jomsborg. In 986, they were recruited by the King of Denmark to subjugate Jarl Horkum of Lauda. But at Jarungavarg, they suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of Jarl Horkum and his son Jarl Erik. Vikings rarely offered or expected mercy. After the battle, the Joms Viking prisoners were lined up for execution. The beheading started and the Joms Vikings, who had a code of their own which forbade them to express fear at any point, one of them for instance said uh, he would not kneel down to be beheaded, he insisted on standing up and being beheaded from the front so that people could see that he did not flinch from the blow. But one guy does kneel down to be beheaded and he says, I'm a bit worried about my hair. I don't want to get blood on it. <laughs> Could somebody very kindly take my hair and pull it over my head and then the beheading can go on. But as the axe falls, he jerks his head back and the falling axe cuts off the hands of the man who's been holding his hair. Well, that's bad sense of humor for you. What a joke. Everybody laughs like nobody's business, in particular, actually, Jarl Eirik, who thinks he's never seen anything so funny in all his life. It was such a good joke, he says, well, uh, we'll let you off. And the Jomsviking very properly says, uh, can't accept that unless you let all the others off too. So the other Jomsvikings are then all spared. Well, you know, uh, obviously complete fiction. No, can't believe a word of it. Hmm. Yeah, about... 15 miles away in that direction from where we're standing. Just recently, they were digging for a new road and they came upon a pile of skeletons, about 50 odd, and a separate pile of skulls. All the skeletons had been beheaded and analysis showed they were all male, they were mostly young, and they were all Scandinavians. Okay. So there was a mass beheading, just as described in the saga, and furthermore, several of the, uh, the, the men had been beheaded from the front, just as in the saga. Mm. So once again, what appeared to be complete fiction turns out to have some corroboration in hard fact. The death of King Olaf Skald Skilsladors, Norway, in uh, 1030 AD. Olaf Haraldsson, King of Norway. The what is up, DS3 TV? We are back to finish up this video because, yeah, the camera died. So that's nice. You see another cut right here. That's because the camera died. And uh, yeah, so let's get back into watching Epic History TV and finish watching the five great Viking deaths. We're like halfway through the video. Well, a little bit over half. So you know, we'll be through it, and uh, don't forget to subscribe. Want to get 500 subscribers by January 14th, and yeah, let's get back into the video and play. Or he became a Christian king. In 1029, the Danes, supported by local Jarls, drove Olaf into exile. When he and his followers returned the next year to reclaim the throne, they were met by a huge army of hostile pagan farmers. Retreat was not an option for Olaf. 
On the morning of battle, the restless king rose early and asked his poet, Thormod, to sing to him, to pass the hours before the army gathered. And Thormod immediately starts to sing the Bjarkamal, which is actually a poem supposed to be sung by Bhutvar Bjarki on the morning of the last stand of King Wolf, which we've discussed already. Dagger is upcoming, Dunya Hana Fjadrar, Maules Vil Mugum at Vina Elfidi, Vaki Eok Vaki, Vina Hoveth, Alir Ini Utstu, Adils of Sinar, Har in Hath Krepi, Rofer Skotandi, Aitum Godir men, there is Eki Fligia, Vecca Uther at Vini, Neat Vives Runum, Vecca Uther Hurthum. Hildar at Lakey. The day has come up. The roosters clap their wings. Time for the wretched serfs to do the heavy labour. Wake now, wake, company of friends, all you best ones of Athil's people. Har the hard grip, Rolf the shooter, men of good birth, they who do not flee. I do not wake you to wine, nor the whispers of women. I wake you to the hard sport of Hildar. It seems a strange choice for a poem because it is in a way a suicide poem. It's uh, saying we're all going to get killed. Is this a good morale raiser? Yeah, they're Vikings. They think it's great. Everybody says super song, just the thing. That's good. Because dying in battle means that you're going to go, you know, it meant for them that you're going to go to Valhalla, which was, you know, an amazing, an amazing thing for them. That's why they didn't fear death. It started on the battle. But the odds were stacked against King Olaf and his men. Thormod's song of brave men rising to face certain death proved a premonition. The battle is lost. King Olaf is killed uh, fighting in the front rank and is brought down by a series of spear and axe blows. And as you would expect, uh, all his uh, chosen companions, all his bodyguard are, are killed around him. But Thormod, Thormod the poet, survives. Not his fault, he just happens to survive. And at the end of the battle, when it's all over, he laments that he has not been allowed to join his king. And at that moment, an arrow comes flying from nowhere and hits him. Mm. And the obvious implication is the dead king sent it. He sent it so as to give Thormod his wish that he could join Olaf. And uh, Thormod then uh, composes a poem about his own wound and dies without quite finishing it. He dies on his feet, still reciting the poem, but he doesn't complete the last line, which fortunately is completed for him by a bystander. And the bystander is the teenage Harold Hardrada. Harold Hardrada's last stand, Stanford Bridge in England, 1066. Harold Hardrada grew to become King of Norway and one of the greatest Vikings of all. His adventures led him east to the city of Kiev, where he served at the court of Grand Prince Yaroslav the Wise, then to Constantinople, where he commanded the Varangian Guard of the Byzantine Emperor. As King of Norway, Harold the Hard Ruler was brave, cruel and acquisitive and in 1066 set his sights on the English throne. But King Harold Godwinson marched north to meet him, moving so rapidly he caught the Vikings off guard at Stamford Bridge. The thing about the Battle of Stamford Bridge is that Harold Hardrada and his invasion force, they were caught napping. Uh, Harold Godwinson marched very quickly up to York and kept on marching through York, and the first thing the Norwegians knew about it was seeing uh, the glint of weapons approaching. But it was a hot day, and the Norwegians had left their heavy equipment, especially their armor and their shields, down on their ships. So they were actually uh, facing an armored force without their armor. Heedless of the risk, Hardrada advanced into battle at the head of his men. According to the Heimskringla sagas, written by the Icelander Snurri Sturluson, he composed poetry even now. From Gungum, Veri Fulkigu, Brunju Lösir und Blaregjar, Kalmar Skina, Hefkat Mina, 
nu ligger struz vart at skipum nedri. Forward we go in formation, without armor against blue steel edges. Helmets shine, I don't have mine. Now our gear lies down with the ships. I think it's quite good actually, the poem. But uh, Harold, who is a terrible poetic snob, uh, thinks about it for it and says, no, that, that, that was too simple. Um, and then he produces another poem in a much more complex uh, and high class meter and says, that's much better. Hardrada threw himself into the thick of the fighting, unarmored, wielding his sword with both hands. Fearless and defiant to the end, he died with an English arrow in his throat, alongside most of his army. He is often called the last Viking. According to the saga, the Norwegians arrived in 400 ships and the survivors went home in 24. Um, the Anglo-Saxons let them go. Uh, well, uh, that you might say, put an end to ideas that uh, England could be conquered by Norwegians or Danes or Vikings. Uh, the Viking era then was over. Harold Hardrada, you can only say, well, he, he died like a Viking, making jokes, making poems, lashing out with both hands uh, until he was killed. But can these poems really be attributed to Harold Hardrada? I don't see there's any way that the poems could be genuine. After all, who was there to note it down or remember it? Practically none of the Norwegians survived. I expect Snorri Sturluson made them up himself uh, to help his story out. But they're good poems. They express a kind of, um, not regretful attitude, but it's sort of rueful. Yeah, well, um, we're not gonna win this one. Um, they caught us this time. Oh, well, that's the way it goes. Uh, we will just have to fight it out. And that strikes me as, again, a characteristic Viking attitude. The Battle of Stamford Bridge had unintended consequences, paving the way for another invader to become King of England. The Battle of Stamford Bridge was, of course, a, a catastrophe. It was a catastrophe for the Norwegians, but it was a catastrophe for the English as well, because they took very heavy casualties as well. And three weeks after the Battle of Stamford Bridge, they fought the Battle of Hastings against William the Conqueror. And you can't help thinking, uh, if they'd been at full strength, they'd have won. On the 14th of October, 1066, the English army suffered a crushing defeat at Hastings, and Harold Godwinson was killed. England's new king, William the Conqueror, was himself descended from a Viking adventurer. The Viking Age was at an end. For nearly three centuries, Europe had been terrorized by Scandinavian warriors, whose attitude to death gave them a dangerous edge. What finally strikes me about the Viking mindset is not so much the defiance in the face of death, that's what you expect heroes to do. It's actually the um, matter-of-fact attitude and also the, uh, the liking for some kind of a joke. You can actually use vulgar words, like Ragnar in the snake pit. You can play dirty tricks, like Vuger with his Pledge of Allegiance. Or you can play practical jokes, like the Joms Viking getting the guy's hands cut off. Or you can nitpick about poetry, like uh, Thormod and uh, Harold Hardrada. All these say, death is coming, it's certain, but actually, uh, I'm going to see what I can do to make this memorable. What it makes me think is that uh, when it comes to Vikings, you can kill them, and speaking as an Englishman, we did, over there. But frighten them, that's not gonna work. They're always going to come back at you. You're not safe until the very last one of them is dead. Well, that was a good, that was a good ending and a good conclusion to, yeah, <laughs> to, like to what the Vikings were. Yeah, you couldn't, you could not scare them with death because they weren't, they weren't afraid of much of it. They really weren't afraid of anything. So it, it didn't, it like nothing could really, nothing could really hurt them, <laughs> you know, and 
it and that turned out to be you know just the known thing of vikings and yeah that's what most people know about the vikings today um if you do know anything about the vikings that's what people know today but yeah talk to you uh guys in the next video thank you guys for 320 subscribers uh then we have 20 like 324 that's how i'm making this video and uh yeah also subscribe, subscribe to the channel i want to get 500 subscribers by Valentine's, i mean by january 14th and uh yeah talk to you guys in the next video and peace